We are very happy to have Liz. Uh, she's a local here. And uh, she will tell us about uh, gravity and the bone duality. Please do. Thank you. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. So as I'm sure many of you are aware, there's been a lot of exciting developments on black hole information and the black hole information paradox over the past year. And I'd like to share with you today some recent work with my collaborator, Rafael Busso. Uh, we just put out a paper a couple weeks ago entitled Gravity Ensemble Duality, in which we investigate an interesting puzzle that appears in these, these recent uh, calculations regarding black hole information paradox. And we suggest a possible resolution to this puzzle. So before I get into explaining the puzzle itself, um, I'm going to do a bit of a review of the black hole information paradox, just to remind you what it is and how we investigate it. And then I will state the, the new puzzle, the new paradox that Raphael and I have uh, pointed out and describe in, in general terms a possible solution to this problem. And then I'll go through three particular examples of calculations uh, that have been done recently that seem to exhibit this puzzle and demonstrate how our proposed resolution solves it in each case. And along the way, we'll require some uh, technical, technical work to, to make sense of the paradox in each setting. So first, uh, as I said, a quick reminder of the black hole information paradox. So the black hole information paradox is an apparent contradiction between uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity which appears when you consider an evaporating black hole uh, produced from matter that started in a pure state. So Hawking's calculation of Hawking radiation in 1975 uh, demonstrated that um, black holes should evaporate, which is a, in itself a surprising feature, but an interesting uh, feature of his calculation is that he predicted that the radiation emitted from the black hole should come out in a thermal state. And this, uh, this seems to conflict with the principle of unitarity in quantum mechanics, which states that any scattering experiment should preserve uh, quantum information. And so unitarity would imply that if we created the black hole from matter in a pure state, and then measured all the radiation once the black hole had completely evaporated, this radiation should still be in a pure state. But this conflicts with Hawking's calculation, which stated it should be in a thermal state. So uh, one way we can examine the state of the radiation to try to figure out what's going on in, in the evaporation and try to see what to make, how to make sense of this puzzle is to track the entropy of the radiation. The von Neumann entropy is uh, defined like this for a state in, with a density matrix rho. It's a minus trace rho log rho. And it's a useful diagnostic because it's zero for a pure state and then it's positive and um, larger for, it, it's larger the more mixed the state is. And in particular, if we have a system that is bipartite, uh, the, the appropriate entropy is the entanglement entropy, which is just the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix in one of the two regions. So if we wanted to look at the, the information flow during black hole evaporation, we could look at the entropy, the entanglement entropy of the outgoing radiation. And Hawking predicts a different, uh, different curve for this entropy than unitary evolution. So Hawking predicted that since the, um, the radiation comes out in a thermal state, the entropy should just continue to increase as the black hole evaporates. But uh, according to unitary evolution of the black hole, then at some point the entropy needs to turn around and come back down to zero so that once the once all of the radiation has come out, it's again in a pure state. And this point at which it turns around is called the page time, and this curve predicted unitary evolution is called the page curve. And the page time is defined to be the point at which the entropy of the, out, the radiation that's come out is equal to the area of the black hole over 4G. So generally, although there, there seems like there might be compelling reasons to expect either Hawking's calculation to be correct or uni unitary evolution to be correct. Generally, most people have expected unitarity to win out in the end. 
And one major reason for this is, of course, the ADS-CFT correspondence, which implies that there should be a unitary description of black hole evaporation since the CFT is unitary. So what has, what's been surprising in these recent developments in the black hole information paradox is there have been some calculations. Let's see, for example, these papers here, and then there have been uh, following calculations that computed the page curve, which is what we expect from unitary evaporation. They computed the page curve starting from a semi-classical bulk. So their setup involved starting with the space, time, and matter computed like Hawking did using semi-classical gravity. But then instead of computing the outgoing state of the radiation like Hawking did, they compute the entropy directly using a different technique, the Larchi prescription, which I will describe uh, later. So the surprising thing is that they started with Hawking's calculation, but computed the page curve, which is what you'd expect for unitary evaporation. So in these, in these calculations, it seems like they raise a, a kind of puzzle in, in that the calculation uses Hawking's result for the radiation entropy, as we will see when I go through some examples. So it seems to use Hawking's result, but nonetheless, the conclusion is that the page curve comes out of the, the radiation's entropy. So the entropy follows the page curve. So that seems to be contradictory. How should we make sense of this? And this, this paradox, or an equivalent of this paradox, which I will review in a moment, was first pointed out in this paper here in a slightly different setting. So, so one thing you could say in response to this, which isn't particularly satisfying, but you could, you could say this, is that the RT calculation, this calculation, te this calculational technique, which computes the entropy directly, is just a black box calculation that makes use of Hawking's state, which is the incorrect state. It makes use of it, uh, but Hawking's state is still wrong. So for some reason, it still appears in the algorithm. Now, this isn't particularly satisfying because well, first, it doesn't ex explain the success of the procedure. And also, it means that we can't infer uh, features of the space-time from Hawking's calculation. So just like we can't assume that the outgoing radiation is thermal, we can't deduce from Hawking's space-time that there is a smooth horizon, for example. So we would like to uh, suggest, well, this, this, uh, this idea was first suggested in that slightly different version of the state paradox, which I will mention in a moment. But we like to uh, continue suggesting and expand upon the idea that gravity ensemble duality can resolve this problem. And gravity ensemble duality is the statement that there is a duality between the gravitational path integral and an ensemble of quantum mechanical theories without gravity. So in the usual ADS-CFT correspondence, you have a gravitational theory, and that's a dual to some quantum mechanical theory. And the suggestion is, if the quantum mechanical theory side is in fact an ensemble of quantum mechanical theories, this will solve the problem. So I'll explain this in more detail, um, but it's easiest to explain it and see the state paradox if we start with an example. So next what I will do is I will discuss how the state paradox appears in three different settings. Uh, the first one is the one that I already I just mentioned, uh, and that one is in the, in the case where we have an evaporating black hole and there's a detector in the space time that's collecting all the radiation. Then I'll look at the case where we have an evaporating black hole and we couple the space time to an auxiliary system which collects the radiation. And then we'll look at that same system with the auxiliary system, but we'll analyze it with an additional level of holography. And so I'll be explained along the way. And along the way, we'll have to determine what RT prescription is relevant for each setting. So this is the, the algorithm that computes the entropy. And then I will show how the, the paradox is resolved by gravity ensemble duality in each of these cases. So all three examples will require some similar basic setup. So the, the uh, basic holographic duality, just to explain our, our notation and how we're going to depict things, um, is a duality between a d minus one dimensional CFT defined on a manifold in d minus one dimensions. And that, that CFT has a bulk dual in d dimensions, which is an asymptotically 
ADS to space time. And you'll notice that we're using D minus one dimensions and D dimensions for these two levels. And that's because eventually we're going to add a third level of holography, which will be D plus one dimensions. So this is just for consistency with that. So the CFT is defined on the D minus one dimensional manifold. And that in this picture is depicted as the surface of the cylinder. And then the bulk tool is on the D dimensional manifold, which is the interior of this cylinder. And we'll uh, indicate the, this kind of duality with this single arrow. And so something that is useful to note is that the D dimensional manifold can have a boundary, which it, is called an end of the world frame, which is depicted with this red, this red sheet here in this picture. And a particular example of when this might be the case is if the CFT is on a manifold in D minus one dimensions, which has a boundary. Um, so, it would, so the CFT is a boundary conformal field theory. So you can see that if the CFT, um, which is on the, the surface of the cylinder, has this boundary on the green line, then we end up with an end of the world grain in the d-dimensional bulk. So now let me describe the first example in which the state paradox appears. And this, this case was investigated by Rafael Busso and his collaborator, Maria Tomasevic. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, but the, the setup that they have, uh, the setup that they examine is a black hole that's evaporating and it is placed in a manifold uh, in a space time in d dimensions and this black hole is formed from a pure state collapse of matter in a pure state and in the space time we place a distant detector sphere or dyson sphere which is uh, indicated by this purple line here and the function of the dyson sphere is to absorb the outgoing radiation and that allows the black hole to evaporate and then there is a standard duality between this space time and a CFT in D minus one dimensions located on the boundary here in, in this picture. So now, um, first, what I'd like to show is, or discuss what they show in this paper, which is that uh, a calculation of the entropy in this set setup uh, matches the prediction of unitarity, even though this is starting from a semi-classical ball, a semi-classical ball. And to do that, we'll need to apply the RT prescription, which is a, a, a technique for computing the entropy that can be compactly encoded as an ADS CFT technique. So if we are interested in computing an entropy um, in a boundary region, so a region in the D minus one dimensional theory in our notation, uh, depicted with this, this blue line here, then you can compute it by finding the generalized entropy, which is defined like so, in a particular space-time region, which is in the d-dimensional bulk, and it's depicted in purple in this picture. And this is called the entanglement wedge. And the entanglement wedge is defined as a region that satisfies these three conditions. So the homology condition, which is the condition on the boundaries, and uh, one, one important feature of the homology conditions is that it's partly bounded by uh, the surface gamma d, which is called the RT surface. Oh, and also a, a side note, when I say RT, I'm really meaning RT in any of its appropriate generalizations. So HRT, quantum HRT, any of, any of those. So we'll just, I'll just call them all RT for the sake of, for ease of speaking. Uh, but so this, this I'm referring to, I'll refer to as the RT surface. And that's depicted in yellow in, in this picture here. And this RT surface is selected such that the generalized entropy uh, is stationary under variations of this surface. And then if there are multiple options that, are, that satisfy these two conditions here, then you pick the one that has the smallest generalized entropy. So this, this procedure is usually involves some sort of extremization and minima minimization. And then the entropy of the region on the, on the boundary, this, this blue region here, which is what we're trying to compute, we compute as the generalized entropy of this entanglement wedge once we've identified it. And it's the area of the, the boundary of the entanglement wedge in the, in the physical space time, plus any entropy of matter enclosed in the entanglement wedge. 
And you can see that if we have a, a, a d-dimensional manifold that has a boundary out of the world brain, this red sheet, then the entanglement wedge, as it says in the homology rules, can include a piece of that, which is this, this orange slice here. So this RT prescription will allow us to compute the entropy of, the bound, of a boundary region. And we can use this to demonstrate that we get a result that is consistent with unitarity, which is what they do in this, this paper here. So uh, the calculation they do is to select the entire boundary to be the region of interest. And as a result, the appropriate entanglement wedge is the entire bulk at a particular time slice. Um, and that's because uh, the, the, the surface, the RT surface in that case is the empty surface, so the area term is zero. And it also, the entanglement wedge being the entire bulk means it includes both the outgoing Hawking radiation and the interior modes. And those, uh, as, as calculated by Hawking, those are maximally entangled and purify each other. So if you include both of them, that means that any matter field entropy is zero, any contribution inside the entanglement wedge is zero. And so that implies that the entropy uh, is zero for all time. And this is consistent with unitarity because if we, if we started with matter in a pure state as we did by assumption, then we start with a, um, a, a, pure, a pure boundary state with S equals zero, then we should expect the evolution, if it's unitary, to maintain the entropy of being zero on the, in the boundary state. So, uh, so this, this shows us an entropy that is consistent with unitarity. Now you can also slightly modify this setup, which they, they do in this paper here, to produce the page curve, uh, which was, if you recall, it was the, uh, the prediction of unitarity for the entropy of the radiation when we divided the, the space-time into two subregions. So if we, if we um, in the previous calculation, we just took the entire boundary to be the region of interest. But now we can, we can um, divide the space-time into two subregions and compute the entropy of just one of them, and it will demonstrate the page curve, as we'll see. So the only difference in this setup is to Take, once, the, once the radiation has been collected by the Dyson sphere, as soon as it hits the Dyson sphere, you assume that it's immediately transferred to a reservoir at a particular spot on the Dyson sphere, which in this picture here, um, this is a time slice. This, this picture is one time slice. So here's the horizon. Here are the entangled uh, Hawking, Hawking modes. And the reservoir is just indicated as this, this red dot. And so I'll remind you that this purple ring is the Dyson sphere. So as soon as the, as soon as the radiation is collected by the Dyson sphere, it's moved immediately to the reservoir. So that's the only difference. And then we can do a similar calculation applying the same RT prescription, but this time instead of using the entire boundary as our region of interest, we use just the subregion, which is next to the reservoir. So in this picture, it's this, this green subregion here. So this is a time slice, um, and this, this particular time slice is before the page time. And again, this, this purple ring is the Dyson sphere. This, this green, greenish ring here is the horizon. And then this green region on the boundary is our Rd minus one of interest, of which we're computing entropy. And this ring here is the boundary. And then the yellow, yellowish green region is the entanglement wedge of Rd minus one. So before the page time, if you compute the, general, the entropy using the RT prescription, which I uh, discussed uh, previously, then you find that, or these, the, these authors find that the, um, the minimal surface, the appropriate RT surface is this one here, which is the border of the, the yellow region, and it encloses the Dyson sphere, and it's homologous to the, the boundary region that we selected. So this, this part is just constant, the area term is just constant, but then the, 
the reservoir is collecting more and more Hawking radiation over time. So the entropy of this, uh, this component is increasing. So this gives us the rising part of the page curve. So then if we look at a time after the page time, at this point, uh, it becomes beneficial to include an extra piece of the RT surface, right? Like just right next to the horizon. So we pick up an additional area term because uh, the RT surface now includes this extra, this extra piece right back at horizon. But because, because we've placed that, that extra piece there, we now include the interior of the black hole in the entanglement wedge. And this, this has become known as an island um, in, in these uh, recent papers. And because this island is included in the entanglement wedge, we now include all the Hawking pair, all of the pairs. So they purify each other and any entropy contribution from the matter cancels out. And so this, this term here is decreasing over time because it sits right by the horizon and it decreases at an area as the horizon decreases in area while the black hole is evaporating. So this gives us the falling part of the page curve and eventually it continues to fall until this area term shrinks to, to zero. And so this yields the page curve. So again, this is an interesting result because we started from semi-classical analysis and then computed something consistent with unitarity. And it seems to yield a contradiction in that the Gener the uh, usual ADS-CFT extrapolate dictionary would imply that the, the boundary state entropy should just be the entropy of the Dyson sphere. So as the Dyson sphere increases in entropy, then the, the boundary state should increase in entropy as the black hole evaporates. But that conflicts with unitarity and the result that we got from the RT prescription in which the boundary state uh, entropy follow the page curve. So this, uh, this conflict uh, appears in the boundary state entropy. And this is the, the example of the paradox in this particular setting. And so um, we argue that this, is, this problem is resolved if we assume gravity ensemble duality. And the, the general statement of gravity ensemble duality is that the path integral is computing averages in an ensemble, where an average is defined like so, where the, ind the, um, the index nu indexes the theories, and then C is just some appropriate weighting. And the reason this resolves the, the problem is because each individual theory is unitary, which means that the outstate in each individual theory has zero entropy for any theory that you pick. But when you compute the average entropy, this, this is still zero. And then, if you compute the average outstate instead, because the outstate can differ across the theories, this can give you a mixed or thermal state, like the, the Hawking state. And then the entropy is something consistent with a mixed state, it's not zero. So the, the proposal is that the, the RT calculations are computing this average entropy, but then Hawking's calculation is computing the average state. And so that's, that allows us to have these, these two different apparent values for the entropy of the radiation. And uh, just a comment that the proposal doesn't, doesn't say what the ensemble is exactly, it's just stating that there is an ensemble. So what the ensemble exactly is is still uh, open for debate and does, doesn't, um, doesn't affect this particular proposal. So here's, here's a, a picture of the resolution of the paradox in these two, two cases that I just showed you. So like I said, the resolution is that the boundary theory is an ensemble of unitary CFTs under this proposal, and the bulk computations yield ensemble averages. So the average state, computing the average state gives you Hawking's curve. So this, this case here is the case where we didn't have the reservoir, and then this case is where we did have the reservoir. So the, computing the average state gives you Hawking's curve here um, in either case, and then computing the average entropy gives you the result that's consistent with unitarity. So zero in this case, or the page curve in the second case. So uh, this, 
this example was not the first chronologically, not the first calculation chronologically that uh, showed a result consistent with unitarity from a semi-classical bulk. This, uh, the, these papers here were the first, and they, they use a, a similar setup, with the main difference being that instead of having a Dyson sphere located in the d-dimensional bulk, we now introduce an auxiliary system, which is a CFT, and it's, uh, it couples, it's coupled to the CFT d-1 uh, here at the boundary, and its function is basically the same as the Dyson sphere in that it, it collects all the radiation, which allows this black hole to evaporate. So this will be the second case in which uh, we can we find an example of this state paradox. So now, because we have this introduction of an auxiliary system, we need to modify our RT prescription slightly to uh, extend it to apply to cases where we have an auxiliary system. So we, we want to use an RT prescription that lets us compute the entropy of some region in the auxiliary system, because that's where the radiation is, and the, um, the boundary region using, the, using a bulk, bulk quantities. And again, the appropriate prescription involves finding the entanglement wedge, which has its own version, and this prescription has its own version of the homology, stationarity, and minimality conditions. And a, a main important difference is that the entanglement wedge of the auxiliary system includes the auxiliary system itself. And um, this, this um, prescription was used in the original papers, but the validity was questioned. It was taken, it was taken as an assumption. In particular, it was assumed that it would be a complementary, complementarity, entanglement wedge complementarity, which states that if you found the entanglement wedge for some region, then the entanglement wedge of the complementary region is, is the, just the rest of the space. So it's the complement of the entanglement wedge. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to say, but in the, if, you if you have two different regions and you find the entanglement wedge of one, the rest of the space should be the entanglement wedge of the second region, if those, those two regions are the, the full, make up the full boundary. So this was assumed, uh, but we, we derived the the prescription from general considerations in our in our paper and um, uh, entanglement wedge complementarity is uh, a consequence of our derivation rather than an assumption. And another another thing to note is that this reduces to the island formula, which appears in this paper here. If you assume that the auxiliary system is a non-gravitating system de described with by a quantum field theory, and you select the d minus one dimensional region to be zero. So given that we have the appropriate RT prescription to apply to this system, we can now ask what the entropy is in the auxiliary system and see if it behaves as we expect from unitarity. And uh, that's what these papers did. And the result is that they find that the entropy does in fact uh, follow the page curve. So if we take a, if we look at a time before the page time, and we select the boundary region, uh, the d minus one dimensional boundary region, to be our region of interest, and compute the entanglement wedge, uh, the entire bulk is the entanglement wedge of this boundary region, just for same argument as in the previous example, and then the comp by entanglement wedge complementarity the auxiliary system's entanglement wedge is just the auxiliary system itself. And because the auxiliary system is collecting all of the outgoing Hawking modes, that means that its entropy is growing, just like the Dyson sphere was. But then again, analogously to the previous example, after the page time, it becomes favorable to add this extra, this extra area term by introducing an additional piece of the RT surface, which allows us to include the island inside the entanglement wedge. So now the entanglement wedge of the auxiliary system is the island and the auxiliary system together. And just like before, the, the modes purify each other, and we just have the area of contribution from this additional piece of the, um, of the RT surface, and that is shrinking 
with the black hole event horizon as, as the um, black hole continues to evaporate. So that gives us the falling part of the page curve. So we have the rising part from, from before the page time, the falling part after the page time, and then eventually the black hole evaporates and the, the area of this RT surface shrinks to zero. And again, we obtain the page curve overall. These, these, uh, these authors obtain it. So this again gave us a result which was consistent with a unitary evolution of the black hole. And so this time, uh, we, see, we see again that there is a, an apparent contradiction here. Uh, this time it's a conflict in the auxiliary system's entropy. Uh, so you notice that the RT calculation assumes in order to justify including the island in the entanglement wedge after the page time, it assumed that the, the state in aux was mixed because otherwise it wouldn't, it wouldn't be beneficial to add the interior of the black hole. But then the, the result of the RT prescription is that we compute the page curve for the auxiliary system. And that implies that, the, that we have unitary evolution. So this is, this is where, the, where the conflict seems to appear in this case. And again, the, we argued that this is resolved if we assume gravity ensemble duality. Because if the, the bulk calculations compute averages, we can say that the, the bulk computation give us the average state, which is uh, the rising curve, which is what Hawking, Hawking computed, and then the average entropy is computed from the RT calculation, and that gives us the page curve. So the resolution is the same as before, but this time it's in the auxiliary system rather than the, the boundary state. So that's the, that is the, the second example in which the, the paradox appears. And I, I'd like to describe one more example, but unfortunately this example is more complicated. Um, the, the example is, arises from this paper here and then uh, follow-up papers in which you assume that the, the matter in the d-dimensional space-time is itself described by a holographic CFT which implies that we can replace it with its own bulk dual in d plus one dimensions now, so one, one dimension higher. Um, and then this, then we can look at an RT prescription or look at uh, calculations using this doubly holographic level, this d plus one dimensional level. And so as you can, as you can guess, this is, becomes more complicated. The, the, um, the state paradox is a little bit obscured, uh, complicated by the introduction of the second level of holography and also there's an auxiliary system. So first, I'd like to describe uh, double holography in general, this additional level of holography without the auxiliary system and find the appropriate RT prescription and then add the auxiliary system and find the appropriate RT prescription in the case where we have an auxiliary system. And then we can apply it to look at this third instantiation of the paradox. And uh, just a side note, a few days ago, there was another paper by these authors here who, um, who also derived an RT prescription for double holography. So they, and they discussed this, this system in, a, in quite a bit of detail. So let me describe uh, this idea of double holography without the auxiliary system first. So in, us in usual holography, we just have two systems. We have a CFT, in, in our, the way we've defined it, in d minus one dimensions, and then we have a bulk dual to it in d dimensions. And those two levels will be two of our three levels in double holography. Uh, the, the top level, as we call it, is the CFT d minus one. And that is in this picture, in this two dimensional uh, slice here, it's this green dot, and then in this 3D picture, it's the ring, it's defined on this ring here. And then the, the standard holographic bulk tool in D dimensions is depicted with this, this purple line. And then it's this purplish surface in the three dimensional picture. And uh, this holographic bulk tool, the second level is a brain world. And, um, but, but the, if we assume, like I said, that the matter sector in this D dimensional theory is itself holographic. It's a holographic CFT. 
then we can replace it with a d plus one dimensional bulk, which we refer to as the doubly holographic bulk dual. And that is represented by the, the interior of this, this picture or the, the interior of this three dimensional figure. And you'll notice that we, the, um, the boundary of MD plus one is an end of the world grain, uh, which we refer to as EOWD plus one. And then this green sheet is just the part of the end of the world grain that's not MD. So, so really this, this double holography is two uh, sequential applications of uh, single level holography, one going from the D minus one dimensional theory to the D dimensional one, and then from the D dimensional one to the D plus one dimensional one. But we can refer to this relationship between the first level and the third level as its own kind of duality, uh, which we call double holography, and it's, we indicate with this double headed, or double, the double arrow. So now the question is, uh, how, how do we compute entropy of a region in the lowest dimensional theory using quantities in the highest dimensional theory? So we'd like to derive an RT prescription uh, for, for double holography. So we can, um, we can apply this to the third, the third case that I mentioned. So we can, do, we can derive this by simply sequentially applying the two different RT prescriptions so that, that apply at each level. So in the first, the first level of single holography from the D minus one dimensional theory to the D dimensional theory, we can, apply, we can apply the standard RT prescription, and, uh, which I've repeated here for reference. And then the D-dimensional uh, theory is a brain world, and there's an RT prescription that applies to brain worlds as well, which computes a generalized entropy uh, given a region on the brain world. And we can apply that to the second level, the, or the second a layer of holography, going from the second the, the uh, bulk dual to the doubly holographic bulk dual. And if we do that sequentially, uh, we can combine the, the two prescriptions like so. And um, on this, the face of it, it looks like this would be a two-step minimization procedure where you'd have to do the minimization for this first RT prescription, and then you'd have to do the minimization for this second RT prescription according to uh, those three conditions that I mentioned before. So the, the homology, stationarity, and minimality conditions in order to find the appropriate entanglement wedge. But we, we show in our, in our paper that uh, this two-step minimization process is really equivalent to a single-step process where you minimize the generalized entropy over surfaces anchored on the ADSD brain, in the, the D-dimensional uh, brain. And this yields a, a prescription that looks very similar to our previous ones, except now we are looking for a doubly holographic entanglement wedge, which is a region in the highest dimensional bulk dual, the doubly holographic bulk dual in D plus one dimensions. And this, um, this is a, an example. So in this picture, if we picked the, this gold region to be our region of interest in the, the bottom, but in the uh, lowest dimensional theory, which is the CFT D minus one, then its entanglement, its doubly holographic entanglement wedge is the top half of this uh, three dimensional figure. So it's the volume of this top half of the three dimensional figure. And you can see that um, in the homology rules, we have another RT surface, something that plays the role of an RT surface, which is um, represented by this, this purple slice in this example. So this, this RT prescription looks very similar and it has its own version, the appropriate uh, anal analogous version of the homology, stationarity, and minimality conditions, and it just requires one minimization. So now, th this, is, this is useful if we are just looking at a doubly holographic setup. Uh, but now the example that I want to do has double holography in addition to the presence of an auxiliary system. So now we'd like to see what happens when we add an auxiliary system and then find the appropriate RT prescription for that. So now in this case, our top level isn't just a CFT D minus one. Now it's a CFT D minus one plus an auxiliary system, which is a CFT in D dimensions. So in this picture, the top level is 
this uh, CFTD minus one is defined on MD minus one, which is the brown dot. And then we've attached an auxiliary system in D dimensions represented by this blue line, or in the three dimensional picture, the, the top level is the brown circle attached to the, the blue cylinder. And this, this combined system makes up a boundary CFT, which you may remember from the very beginning when I first introduced uh, the, the standard, uh, standard holographic dualities. So yeah, so to con connect this to the, the, the example, uh, the, the setup that we're going to be eventually looking at, this is the space time that has the black hole. And then this is, this is the bulk dual, to, or this is the, uh, the dual CFT to that. And then we've attached the auxiliary system right here. So then the, uh, as I starting to allude to the second, the second level in uh, this version of double holography where we've introduced the auxiliary system uh, is a bulk, a bulk dual in which we replace the CFT D minus one with its bulk dual. So it's this, this single duality here. MD minus one is replaced by MD, but then the auxiliary system uh, is, still, is still present at this level. And so this is a, a brain world as well. And then the, the third level is if we assume that the matter sector on this red region here is a holographic CFT, then we replace it with its um, D plus one dimensional bulk dual. And that gives us the doubly holographic bulk dual, which is the interior of, of this cylinder in this picture. Or I guess it's a, it's a cylinder plus an additional piece. So the interior of this figure. So again, we have uh, sequential applications of single holography, and then we can refer to this top level and doubly holographic bulk tool uh, to be doubly holographic. Uh, so those are the, this is a double holography between one and three, but now it's a, the case where we have an auxiliary system. So now the, the question is, what is the RT prescription for this case? So now we want to find a prescription that allows us to compute the entropy of a region in the auxiliary system using quantities in the D plus one dimensional bulk dual, the highest dimensional bulk dual. And so this, this, uh, this region in gold is the region that we're computing the entropy of. So now we can again derive such a prescription by applying the RT prescriptions that are appropriate for each of the two uh, single levels of holography, single, um, single hol singly holographic relationships. So between the first level and the second level, because we now have an auxiliary system, we apply the RT prescription with an auxiliary system, and we just select aux the auxiliary system to be our, our region script RD. And then from the second level to the third level, we apply the RT prescription for brain worlds and then combine them to give us, again, what looks to be a two-step minimization procedure. But again, uh, we can show that it is just a one-step minimization procedure, which gives us this prescription that, again, looks very similar. Uh, we're computing the entropy of a region in the D minus one dimensional CFT and the region, a region in the auxiliary system. And we do so by finding the doubly holographic entanglement wedge and computing its generalized entropy. And again, this prescription requires the doubly holographic entanglement wedge to follow its own version of the three conditions, the homology, stationarity, and minimality conditions. Liz, could I ask a small question? Yes. Yeah, so for this um, comparison of you know, two minimizations versus a single one, is there something that allows you to fix the location of the brain that it's anchored to, or like what is the step? What is the key step in combining those? Uh... Um, we did a proof by contradiction, I believe. You just imagine, the, or you imagine the two possibilities, where you, you imagine the case where um, the the surface doesn't end on the the appropriate uh, gamma d for the first the first. Uh, oh, you can't see my finger for the first um, minimization and the case where you can. And oh, in either case, you, it, you find that it just has to end on, on a gamma D. Gotcha, okay, Yeah. thanks. Okay, so, okay, so once, once we have the, 
once we have the W holographic RT prescription with an auxiliary system, we can apply it to the, the third scenario that I mentioned. So the setup is very similar to the second example, except like I said, now we assume that the matter in the d-dimensional theory is a holographic CFT, so we can add this additional level of holography. And that's what this paper did in two dimensions, and then there are later papers that looked at higher dimensions. And so now, so now we have a black hole uh, that's evaporating, that's placed on this space-time in d dimensions on, on the red space-time here, so the horizon is indicated in blue. And then we have the auxiliary system still, but now we introduce, now we can look at a, a d plus one dimensional bulk, which is the, again, the interior of this, this figure. And so now, now we want to compute the entropy of a region in the auxiliary system, which I've selected to be this, this gold region here. And we can do it in two, one of two ways. We can use our newly derived one-step RT for double holography with auxiliary system, which I've repeated here for reference. Or we can ignore the second level of holography and just compute the, the entropy using the RT prescription with an auxiliary system. Now this, which I've, again, I've repeated, repeated this here for reference, and this is just setting the auxiliary system equal to our, our script RD in order to do that computation. And uh, this calculation is basically the same as, or it's the same, it's the same reasoning as the second example. So I will focus on this first one here. And so we want to compute the entropy of this region, uh, script RD, and we'll do so by using the one step RT prescription for double holography with an auxiliary system. And that's uh, along the lines of what, these, what this paper did. And if you do so, you find that uh, that the appropriate RT surface uh, before the page time is one that extends across the bulk like this, and thus the the um, the doubly holographic entanglement wedge is this region in the cylinder. It's this the the volume of the green region. I, it's green in this case because it's all this. This surface is like the surface of the cylinder, and then this region RD is also the entanglement wedge. If you do it in the 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 case where you ignore double holography, but we aren't discussing that one. But that's that's why it's green. That's why it looks different. It's not yellow. But so the the doubly holographic entanglement wedge is the volume of this uh, this green region here, and this the area of this surface is growing over time. And because the matter fields have been replaced by uh, geometry, there, there are no matter fields in the d plus one dimensional bulk. The only, the only contribution to the generalized entropy is the area of this surface. So this gives us the rising part of the page curve. So then after the page time, uh, the appropriate RT surface now ends on the the RT surface in D dimensions, that gamma D, which uh, is sat right by the horizon, as in the, the case of the second, the second example of the paradox. And the, so the, the appropriate gamma D plus one, the appropriate RT prescription for these doubly holographic RT is represented by this, again, this dark green uh, line, or this dark green surface here, or this, this line in this region. And this, uh, this corresponds with the appearance of the island. And then this, sur this sur area of this surface is decreasing over time. So that gives us the falling part of the page curve. And eventually it will shrink to zero and then that gives us the, the page curve. So now, although this calculation is using essentially the same scenario as the second, example of the paradox, we get a, a new perspective on the paradox if we look at the doubly holographic bulk dual and we find that there is a bulk dual of the state paradox in that the, the entropy of the script RD region here uh, appears to be different depending on which RT prescription you apply and which, which layers of holography you select to use. 
So like I just said, if you do the RT calculation to compute the entropy of this script RD region using the doubly holographic RT prescription, or if you do it like we did with the second example where you use the RT prescription with the auxiliary system, that gives you the result consistent with, the, with unitarity. It gives you the page curve. But then uh, another, another way you could compute this is to ignore the, the lowest dimensional version, the lowest dimensional theory, and just look at the middle level and the highest dimensional bulk dual. So the bulk dual and the doubly holographic bulk dual. And because that d-dimensional theory, the middle level, is a brain world, we should be able to apply the brain world RT prescription and to, to it to compute the entropy of any region on the brain world. So if we select this script RD region to be a region of interest on the brain world, then when we compute the, or when you find the RT prescription, or the, when you find the RT surface according to the brain world RT prescription, it cannot end on the, on the, the manifold here, MD. And so it just stretches across the bulk and this is the, the surface that was increasing. So that just gives us an entropy that's growing over time. And that corresponds to the entropy computed by Hawking. So it seems like if we, if we use the double holography, we get the result consistent with the page curve. But if we apply the RT prescription just to the, the second level and the third level, we get a different answer. We get the growing, growing entropy. So now, uh, we again argue that this can be resolved using gravity ensemble duality. And as before, the, the resolution, the proposed resolution, is that the CFT in D minus one dimensions is an ensemble of unitary uh, CFTs. And so what's happening is that at the top level, that the lowest dimensional case where we have the B CFT, the CFT D minus one is emitting radiation into the auxiliary system, and this process is unitary. And so the average entropy follows the page curve, just like in the previous examples, as we argued. And then you can compute this average entropy using the first layer, like in the, the, second, the second example of the state paradox. You just use the, the usual single level holography, but with an auxiliary system, or you can compute it with double holography. And then the, just, uh, just like before, uh, the, the claim is that the semi-classical analysis computes the average state, and then the entropy of the average state follows Hawking's curve. But now again, we have two different ways to compute that. We can use just the first level, or we can look at the second, the, um, the bulk dual and the doubly holographic bulk dual, applying that RT prescription for brain worlds. So again, the resolution, uh, a, a possible resolution of the problem is to assume gravity ensemble dwelling. And there are a couple of interesting observations from this particular case. The first is that it does not actually matter for the resolution of this particular example of the paradox, whether the second level of holography, the one that goes from D to D plus one uh, dimensions, is gravity ensemble duality. So you, are, you already did the averaging at the, the first level. So it, it doesn't matter if the second level is an average. It doesn't preclude it from being an average, but it's just not required to resolve this particular example of the paradox. And another observation is that if you look at just the double, double holography, so you just look at the first level to the third level, uh, so the lowest dimensional level to the highest dimensional level, and you look at that duality only, you do not see the paradox. You just, you just find the result consistent with, the, with unitarity. But at the same time, you also skip over the level that describes the evaporating black hole most naturally. So you lose contact with that. So that, that concludes this, um, this final example of the, of the state paradox. So let me quickly summarize and leave you with some last comments and open questions. So uh, like, like I said at the beginning, uh, we, we saw that if you try to make sense of the appearance of Hawking's calculation in the RT prescription calculation, then taking, taking Hawking's calculation's appearance seriously results in this state paradox. 
uh, but it, it seems that this can be resolved if we assume gravity ensemble duality and that the gravitational path integral is computing average quantities in some ensemble theories and the theories in the ensemble are unitary. And then we saw that this state paradox appeared in these three different examples, the case where we had the detector that was absorbing the radiation, the case where we had the auxiliary system uh, collecting the radiation, and the case where the auxiliary system was collecting the radiation and we analyzed the, the, the system with double holography. But in each case, gravity ensemble duality was able to resolve the paradox. So uh, this, this gravity ensemble duality idea isn't just coming from nowhere. I just want to point out that there's other support for it. Um, for example, there's a, the duality between JT gravity and a random matrix ensemble is an example of such, uh, such a gravity ensemble duality. This is a, a two-dimensional gravity theory. And then also these, these works here have uh, recently shown that an average over some 2D CFTs exhibits properties of an exotic 3D theory of gravity. And then there's, there's another uh, a puzzle that appears in some of these reset calculations called the factorization problem, in where if you're computing, if you're computing these entropies using the R2 prescription and frame it in the replica wormhole language, then you find that the partition function on multiple copies of a boundary, which appear in the, in the replica trick, uh, they don't need to factorize when you're computing when you're computing the entropy from the bulk gravity dual because you have contributions from connected geometries and that seems to provide independent support or maybe related support for a gravity ensemble interpretation so uh, some interesting open questions are as i have just alluded to the relationship between this factorization problem and the state paradox it'd be interesting to see if these these problems are, are related in some, some way, maybe they're equivalent or so, somehow, somehow related. They seem to have um, similar resolutions, so it'd be interesting to see if they are related. Uh, also interesting to, to evaluate the status of the firewall paradox, given these considerations. You can see some um, discussion in our paper for that, if you like. And then also open question is what to make of cases where it seems like we don't have an, an ensemble uh, so like the classic example of type 2b supergravity in ADS5 process 5. So those are some open questions. Uh, clearly everything hasn't been entirely figured out, but we propose that this, this uh, resolution does appear to resolve the, the state paradox. Uh, so given, given um, these, there are many open questions still, and there, you may also have some of your own questions. I will now stop and take any questions that you may have. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ruth. I like the applause icons. <laughs> they, should, they should add a, a sound to that. That's true. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions? Me. Could you elaborate more on uh, firewall? On um, sorry, what? Uh, could you uh, explain uh, on a firewall? Oh, oh, um, sure. Okay, so yeah, um, yeah, we don't. So in our, in our in our discussion, we, we say a couple things about this. So it seems like it's it seems like if you if you take the you take the calcula Hawking's calculation seriously in the middle step of RT, it looks like it, it has a smooth horizon, which looks like we might have a case where we compute an entropy that's consistent with unitarity, and then we also have a smooth horizon. Um, but uh, although, although that, that seems to be the case, it also introduces the state paradox as, as like a, a, new, a new paradox. So, um, we need to resolve the state paradox in order to assume from, in order to interpret the Hawking's calculation as giving us a, a, a smooth horizon. It's, we don't get that for free, is what, what I'm saying. But um, there, so then there are, there are two possibilities. The, the first is that the, the RT prescription can be um, considered to be uh, resolved by gravity ensemble duality. But then in that case, 
if we assume that the, the true theory isn't really described by the ensemble, it, it must be described by one of the members of the ensemble. And then that member of the ensemble would be exhibiting a unitary evolution. And that, that member of the ensemble would still hold, would still exhibit all of the AMPS assumptions. And so it seems like we, ha we would still have a firewall in that case. So we, ha we haven't, wouldn't have identified which of the, which of the AMPS assumptions we could uh, eliminate. So then, yeah, so, the, so then, but then if we don't resolve the, the state paradox, then that paradox is still, is still existent. Um, so does, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Okay. Any, any more questions? So your discussion doesn't depend on the, what the auxiliary system is. So you, you could take the auxiliary system as a gra gravitation theory as well? Yes, yeah, so you mean when we, when we derived the RT prescription for yeah. auxiliary systems? Is that what you mean? Uh, I think. Uh, when you say when you said um, our discussion of like the. Uh, well, we we did derive an RT prescription for general auxiliary systems, mm -hmm. and then yeah. if you if you then assume that the auxiliary system takes the form that it did in these uh, these previous calculations where they where they found the island formula, then then you get the island formula. Uh huh. Any more questions? Seems like not. Okay, then let us thank Desayan. Thank you, Liz.